Hello. In this series, I'm contributing the session on critical realism in relation to theory and childhood studies. Critical realism has quite a reputation for being hard work, like rock climbing. Is it worth it? Well, after about nearly 30 years of researching with children, I came across critical realism and I found it so valuable. I do hope, if you don't already know about it, by the end of this session, you'll be think it's worth looking at. Uh, critical realism is a lifelong challenge with philosophers at the higher echelons. And um, my interest is in helping re practical researchers to get onto the lower rungs so that they can apply critical realism. Now, theories are ways of seeing that open and close our vision. Theories may be about topics such as sexism that closes vision or feminism that opens it, decolonialism, childism, and of course, um, epistemic injustice. Um, these are topics that also explain how systems work. A second kind of theories are methods in research such as positivism or interpretivism. And a third, very vital part kind of theory in all research, acknowledged or not, is the political view. Most research is by functionalists who think they're value free and objective. Um, but a few researchers are critical uh, to be discussed later. There are two basic research theory questions in all research. What actually exists and occurs in the world? ontology and how can we know and understand it epistemology people are very put off many most people are by these two greek words um, and unfortunately they tend to be avoided but they really are essential basic to research theory now critical realism really began uh, nearly 50 years ago um, with um, roy basker studying economics at Oxford, he wanted to research poverty in India. And he found that the epistemology, the theories in economics, um, just do not address the ontology, the reality of the poverty in India. And so he turned to philosophy and he developed first um, a theory of um, reality in the natural sciences in 75, and then the possibility of naturalism in 79 about how reality um, theories are shared across the natural and the social sciences, very useful for interdisciplinary research. Uh, he worked, moved on to a second stage of dialectic, which I won't speak much about today, but I find so valuable. And um, in 94, he wrote Plato, etc., about how since Plato for the last two and a half thousand years, most of us have been stuck into certain ways of thinking, asking for evidence, for example, which he challenges, or I challenges. Um, he came to work at the Institute of Education, University, now University College London in uh, 2007 and ran a, a reading group for seven years, which I joined and found invaluable. Sadly, Roy died in 2014 and I took on running the group and we still do it. Um, the latest one is on Zoom and um, this uh, lecture is based on the first session. And if you're interested, you're so welcome to look at the other section, sessions. Another uh, eminent critical realist is Margaret Archer, who has specialised in culture and agency and structure on the nature of being human and the problem of agency. Um, there's also Douglas Papora in the United States, whose brilliant book, Reconstructing Sociology, is a very clear, dynamic read of what's wrong with, he says, American sociology and how to put it right. There's also, for example, Peter Ness and uh, Lee Price, who have written on uh, Critical realism, researching the environment and economics. Critical realism can research any topic and also tends to combine with any research method. 
and Mervyn Hartwig edited the 500 page dictionary of critical realism that um, re-examines many familiar and some new terms and gives them distinctive enriched meanings. Many of you may have heard of David Graeber, who's famous for his work with Occupy and we are the 99%. Sadly, he's the late professor at LSE and his book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years is one of his famous works. And he said, Roy Basker was a great inspiration to me because I felt no one else was really taking on the big philosophical questions in a way that were simultaneously radical and commonsensical, but at a profoundly high theoretical level. And I found that the mixture of practice and theory is so helpful. Now, um, the main traditions in sociology, such as um, positivism and interpretivism, are a bit like disconnected pieces of a jigsaw. And Williams has uh, suggested that sociologists are rather like an orchestra of soloists rather um, often pointing out the faults in one another rather than how we can all work together. Critical realism, I suggest, is like the um, lid on the jigsaw box that tells us something about the picture and the design and how it can all fit together. But of course, uh, social research and society are never complete. There's always infinitely more to research. But critical realism gives us basic guides and connections. Critical realism helps us to under labor. That is like being the um, general helper on the building site, preparing for when the uh, main craftspeople will come in. So critical realism is a philosophy that clears away the rubbish, uh, helps to strengthen analysis and clarify uncertainties and resolve contradictions and confusions and disagreements among social researchers. It also helps to connect different or opposing theories, methods and disciplines. There's a great emphasis on explaining the why questions as well as describing society, the how questions. And that increases the strength and validity of our work and adds to its power and relevance to policy and practice. There are seven tenets um, that can be summarized in um, positivist and interpretivist research and they contradict. And I'll just run through first the positivist ones. First, in the natural and social sciences, the detached researcher, and, and many positivists don't say they're not positivists, they say they're realists or something else, but um, this is the general main tradition from Durkheim. The detached researcher observes objective, self-evident, value-free facts set apart from their social context, often as separate variables, like when they do large surveys. Um, we never meet the anonymous people who've contributed there to the questionnaires. We just see them grouped by variables. So they're set aside from their social context often. They're, um, they are in uh, facts, the survey data and so on, are seen as independent, pristine and the same. Whoever observes, reports or reads about them. They're seen as having essential inherent qualities and a stable lasting reality out there in the world. Uh, existing in data that are unchanged across time and space. So um, they exist in words, meanings, images, neuroscans, statistics, emails. Anywhere in the world, they will be say, read the same. Social and natural science facts can be used to prove general laws, replicable findings, and reliable predictions. And these evidence-based evidence findings, for example, yield self-evident conclusions about cause effect to support effective policy making and problem solving so that neutral researchers don't advise policymakers, but they present the evidence to inform them. And examples of this work are in lab experiments, psychology tests, exam results, the generation cohorts um, of thousands and thousands of people born in the same year, studied over a lifetime, surveys of views and experiences, demographic statistics. Now, in contrast, interpretivist or 
hermeneutic researchers are involved and interactive. The scientist is reflexive, aware of views and context, and sees people, objects, and events as constructed through negotiated interactions, hermeneutics, and perceptions within specific social contexts, cultures and meanings. So far from being context free, the work is contingent. Phenomena are contingent and they have few or no essential inherent qualities. They take their meaning from their context. And so there are no general lasting universal reality, truths or morals that transfer intact across time and space truths and moralities are local. Without these fixed realities, though, it is hard to compare or transfer meaning, to generalise or connect causes to outcomes. And so connections between data, conclusions, recommendations and policy can seem tenuous. Um, the hermeneutic is the way that um, relationships confirm and reconfirm certain directions. For instance, is the adult seeing a needy child? I will provide for you. A victim child? I will help you and rescue you. A contributing child? A strong, resilient child? We will work to solve problems together. And they reinforce their relationship together. So with positivism and interpretivism, each set of the seven tenets can contradict each other. On the one hand, there's a reporting of firm facts, but on the other hand, interpretivists may deny reality, truth, and even facts. Now, another great difference is that most researchers are functionalists um, who more or less assume that society is a beehive-like. They function for the common good. And the aim is to make societies more efficient to find out what works, uh, to use it utilitarianism, and to exclude or reform deviants who are blocking efficiency. Um, they tend to be seen as objective. On the other hand, um, a minority of researchers are critical theorists, and they're interested in scarcity. Um, they think that like um, trees in a crowded wood, everyone competes for limited resources and control. Democracy needs protesters as whistleblowers. They're not deviants to be excluded. And critical theorists follow Marx in wanting to change the world as well as interpret it. They may well be seen as biased, but they would argue that everyone has uh, certain values um, explicit or not. Now back to ontology and epistemology, being and knowing. Both the traditions tend to collapse being into knowing, to turn things into thoughts, living experiences into narratives, discourse, statistical variables, data. They turn ontology then into epistemology and it's called the epistemic fallacy. Now with positivists, if things are hard to understand or prove, their, exist their existence may be doubted. Um, if you can't measure it, then it's not worth researching. Um, if there are problems, positivists want to clean up their data or look for more rigorous methods. If interpretivists encounter problems, they want to search usually for deeper understanding in better theories. Um, critical realists, search also though for underlying realities at three levels. So rather than seeing um, interpretivism and positivism <clears throat> in contradiction, in the bigger picture, they all work together. So for example, in searching for causes at three levels of reality, one in the natural science, there is the empirical, first of all, like rain, our experiences and impressions of many falling objects, raindrops, looking for patterns between them, our sensations, images, evaluations, memories, our thoughts that rain is good for gardens and bad for wedding days. Then at the actual level, we research the objects and events that actually exist, the raindrops, the soaking fields, 
And then at the level of the real low, <coughs> researchers ask, why are the raindrops falling? They are, the real causes are often unseen and they're shown in their effects. The question is, why do objects fall? And the answer is, of course, gravity. And this, this is one of the unseen causes. Another example is, why is there a pandemic? And the answer is the virus. Um, and critical realism says we need to research all these three levels. Now, in the, we're equivalent in the social sciences, are, uh, for instance, poor families' daily life. So the empirical would be families' experiences, views, impressions, sensations, evaluations, memories. At the actual level, there will be the events in their daily life, um, the people, the poor housing, hunger, food banks, income levels. At the real level, why are families poor? We look at unseen causal mechanisms shown in their effects, class, inequality, racism, gender, generation, power, austerity, austerity politics, economics. Now, ignoring the real, the, the third level, is a bit like trying to understand poverty without policy or to understand the pandemic without thinking about the virus. The three levels here are shown with, uh, we research the empirical way people cope with floods. We research the actual flooded fields, but also at the real level, we look at the unseen causes. For instance, industry may be pouring uh, gallons and gallons of water into rivers that then run down to flood the towns. And behind that, of course, there is climate change, which is changing so much. Um, floods and droughts and our relationship with the weather. Um, an example of um, three levels in social research is our paper on three levels of children's informed consent, which maybe we'll discuss in a, the later session. So to um, look at drawing the three uh, kinds of sociology together, um, the interpretivist, positivist and critical realism, you can see that um, all three work on the empirical level. Uh, positivists are more concerned with the actual, but on the whole, uh, it's realists, critical realists, who look at the often unseen real level, but they depend on and draw together interpretive and positivist research. They're all complementary, not in conflict, part of the greater whole. Factual ob observations, miss unseen notice and pressures that explain behavior. For example, is the person begging, apologizing, praying, meditating, doing yoga? This is crucial to understand the social processes and looking at the visible motives. Besides the three levels of reality, critical realism has many, many helpful theories um, and I'm only going to look at two more in this session. And one is the attention to structure and agency. Um, I'm going to look at five approaches to the structure and agency. First, positivists in Dirk Himes and Par Parsons tradition look, use mass surveys and variables and tend to be determinist, looking at strong structures that influence weak agents. So they uh, look at how housing, uh, types of education, methods of administration, uh, it, control um, agents and their reactions. Interpretivists in the Bastein tradition concentrate on the strong agents and structures tend to be sent, seen as weaker in the background. So they can be seen as voluntarism um, and more, more freedom of agency. With Giddens structuration theory, this blurs structure and agency together as if they're both powerful equally. With postmodernism and for instance, actor network theory, uh, agency is very uncertain with um, inanimate objects being called actants um, with equivalent agency to people. With critical realism, 
for example, Basker, Archer, but many others. Structure and agency are separate, distinct, but constantly interacting and changing like the river in the landscape, constantly altering one another and sometimes hitting crises uh, like the dam when they both uh, alter. And these processes need to be understood by looking at both structure and agency and their interactions. This photo of the girls indicates how much structures affect their daily lives, their fashions, technologies. They would have looked so different in um, 1922 or 1822 or 1722. And um, they, we need to look at how structures like childhood and youth shape human life and society. Now, structures, of course, precede and outlast agents, but they can only be enacted through human agency. Structures are determining, but not determinist, because they compete in open systems of many forces, not closed systems of a single predictable overriding force which randomized control trials attempt to construct. For instance, I've mentioned um, culture, um, technology, there's also economics, um, fashion, gender, uh, numerous influences all interacting together so that we have limited agency. We live in conditions that are not of our own choosing where we are born in our family, our society. So we're thrown into these contexts. Our actions have unintended, counterproductive, unwanted, limited, often unpredicted effects. Um, Margaret Archer has looked in detailed analysis of agency through how we have internal conversations where as agents we draw on our surrounding structures to make sense of our lives. Um, with um, Tamaki Yoshita, I have written a couple of papers on structure and agency and children's rights. Now, um, critical realism have, is, has many other useful theories and frameworks for analyzing all aspects of childhood. And two um, big analytical frameworks, one of the four planes of social being, where all aspects of being human are covered by the four planes bodies, immaterial relations with nature, interpersonal relations, larger structures or contexts, and inner being. And um, these are the basis of my two books on childhoods, real and imagined, and the politics of childhood, real and imagined, um, showing how we can study childhood through critical realism. There's also over time the four interacting stages of transformative change. And um, one of our papers on this has been looking at children's consent to surgery through the four stages of change. I could go on for hours about critical realism, but I'll stop now. And I do hope um, if you're not already using it, I've interested some of you in looking at it further. Thank you.